Hello, ASM. Hey! All right, good job. From the American Society for Microbiology, this is TWIM. This week in microbiology, this is episode 178, and today is June 10th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Today we're recording at ASM Microbe in Atlanta, Georgia. And joining me today, all three TWIM co-hosts, all the way over there on the right, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Michelle Swanson. Hello. Wonderful to see you all here. And Elio Schechter. Well, hello, everybody. And how about a big hand for the crew? We can use all the hands we can get. We have a special guest today who is at this meeting presenting, and we're going to talk to her about her work. She is from the St. Petersburg Coastal and Marine Science Center. Christina Kellogg, welcome to TWIM. Thanks, Vincent. Glad to be here. Happy to have you. Before we start, I have two things to tell you. First of all, I am 10 people away on Twitter from 13,000. Can we please? <laughs> you know, I said this yesterday at TWIV, and I didn't make it. So P-R-O-F-V-R-R on Twitter. Follow me. Let's see if the microbes can get it up over the 13,000 marks where the, where the virologists did not. By the end of the show, I want to be there. <laughs> Secondly, if you ask a question, you will get a swine flu plushie. All right, we have five of these to toss out. So think of your questions as Christina talks. I'm sure she'll give you lots of fodder for questions. And then, of course, we have here... Ooh. Ooh. Cool twim shirts, which we're going to throw out. Not now. I'm not telling you when. So those of you who leave, you're losing out, okay? You gotta wait, just stay there. I know it's hard to stand up in the back, but we'll throw them out at some point. Okay, Christina, let's talk about first you a little bit, your background and training. Where are you from? So I grew up on a charter boat in the Virgin Islands, which might have a tiny bit to do with why I ended up as a marine scientist. You grew up on a boat? Yeah. Wow. Like from age zero? Uh, from age three. My parents were those people who decided to take a year's leave of absence, buy a boat even though they didn't know how to sail and just run away and then never came back. And, and you sailed around. Where, what parts of the oceans did you sail um, around? We started from Maryland, went down the intercoastal waterway, went as far down island as St. Martin, St. Bart's, and Saba, and then came back to the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is just below Puerto Rico because it was U.S. and they wouldn't need work permits to stay there. Did you have brothers or sisters? Nope, it's just me. <laughs> Some people are homeschooled, other people are boat schooled. <laughs> and, and in fact, I was. First through eighth grade, I was homeschooled. How, so how many years of your life did you spend on this boat? Uh, we didn't move ashore until I was 17, so right before I went away to college. Wow, it's amazing. So you, you're okay on boats. You, you're used to the tilting and all that. Right? Yes, I, I do well when I go out to sea. And of course, now you spend some time on boats as well for your work, right? Yes, all smaller right. boats for coastal work and large ships for blue water work. So you, then you, you went to college, so obviously you had to get off the boat, right? Is that the first time you stepped? You said 17. Is yeah, that when you so, got you know, my senior year, I was actually living ashore. And where'd you go uh, to college? Was that a big shock? I, no, it was actually, there was incredible freedom because you could just walk out the door and go somewhere. You didn't have to get a dinghy and permission to go ashore. A dinghy. Yeah. A dinghy. So, your, your parents had control over you, right? Yes. <laughs> they didn't give you the key to the dinghy. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so at some point you went to college. Where did you end up going? So I did my undergraduate work at Georgetown University. Why did you pick that? Um, I, had, I had gone on a number of tours during my junior year, and uh, my grandparents lived very close to D.C., so that was one of my target areas. Okay. And my parents were really hoping I would go to the Naval Academy because it would be free, but I was kind of freaked out at the idea of getting up at 5 in the morning and having to get a bunch of vaccinations and possibly having to have short hair, so I wasn't having it. And I <laughs> we went on this tour at Georgetown and just loved the buildings and the fact that it felt like a small campus, even though it was in the middle of a big city. Did you have boat withdrawal? No. <laughs> You're okay. All right. And what did you major in at Georgetown? It, biology. All right. And uh, did that, is that something that came from being on a boat and seeing the oceans around you, this interest in biology? It, to a degree, but what really catalyzed it was a phenomenal marine biology teacher my senior year mm. of high school. 
So his name was Mark Deby, and he took us on field trips, which previously had never happened in this little island school that I went to, and really showed us the connections between ecosystems, so mangroves to seagrass to coral reefs. And so, in fact, as a junior, I had applied to colleges based on my plan to go into business administration. And so my senior year, I had to evaluate my acceptances based on which schools also had a good biology program mm -hmm. because that's what I was going to pivot to. Cool. And obviously, this had to be influenced by seeing the ocean all the time, right? Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> all right, then. I'm, I'm very quiet. You are? But not on, not on TWIM. Well, I, I disguise it. And here we are on I TWIM. Give it a hit. <laughs> <laughs> I remind you, it's TWIM. So uh, at the end of, co of college, what did you do? I, I literally rolled straight from college into graduate school at the University of South Florida because I was determined to go directly to a PhD without stopping to get a master's. So you knew that from the beginning of yes. college, right? And, and what was that PhD in? Uh, biological oceanography, really specializing in molecular microbiology. So what kind of experiments? Did you go out in, on boats again? <laughs> yes, that, that started my, you know, my second career in boats. We, we were doing a lot of work on um, bacteriophage and host systems in the ocean. So we would go out, filter large amounts of water, and then plate and use molecular surveys to try and find out what the viruses were. And I was looking at genetic diversity between viruses that all um, infected the same host. So and, and did your parents kind of pull up alongside the boat? <laughs> <laughs> Usually in different locations. I didn't actually start getting to do work back in the Virgin Islands until I was at USGS, but now I've occasionally combined field work and family. <laughs> so your parents are still on the boat? They are not still on the boat, but they are still in the Virgin Islands. Okay. So they had an exciting year last year. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. All right, so you really did a PhD in virology, didn't you? Technically, oh, yes, to, I did. It had to come in. It had to come in. It's a wonderful field. <laughs> Lovely. So if, I'm a, if he says for himself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, you got a PhD, then what? What's next? Um, I loved doing marine virology, but it was a little off-putting to me that in all that time, my family had no idea what I was doing. When I would mm. try and explain about genetic diversity of viruses in the ocean, it was just not helping. And so I came out of my PhD with this great idea that I wanted to do something more applied and that I probably wanted to go into industry so I could make obscene amounts of money because that seemed like a really great plan. <laughs> and so I actually got an NIH-funded postdoc to look at um, antifungal drug development at Georgetown University Medical Center in collaboration with a couple of drug companies. And that sounded great. I mean, how applied is that? What do you do? I'm trying to find new drugs. Boom, everybody gets it. And I actually made an important discovery in doing that, that I really didn't like it because there was no field work. You know, I didn't go out of the lab anymore. Samples came to me. I worked on them. I also couldn't go to meetings and talk about what I found because a lot of it was proprietary and I missed being able to share what I do with people. And I, I just, I was missing some of that excitement. And so I jumped at the chance when a Mendenhall Fellowship came open. It was the first year they had that program at the USGS to one, move back to St. Pete where I had done my graduate work and to be able to combine what I had done about viruses and bacteria and now fungi into environmental science again. And you gave up the idea of making a ton of money. I did give up on the ton of money. I, I discovered that being happy and really being passionate about my job was more important than having obscene amounts of money. Wow. <laughs> Could, could you tell us a little bit more about the portfolio of the USGS? Uh, so it's bigger than most people think. So many people, when they hear USGS, uh, think of maps, because for a long time the USGS was famous as the people who made maps. They also immediately think of geology and cataloging the mineral resources of the USGS. And while that's still true, there's a ridiculous amount of other science in USGS. So there's a whole mission area that looks at water in terms of water use, um, stream gauging, the water quality of streams and other water sources. There's an entire biological division, mostly now focused on ecosystems, but that look at things like wildlife disease or um, movement of diseases between ecosystems, um, looking at different animals and their distribution like manatees. So there's an incredible amount of diversity within the USGS. And so most people immediately see where I'm from start talking to me as a geologist and I have to stop them because I am not and have never been. It's all microbiology. And I'm sure there's not one building where all that happens, but there are stations all around the country? Correct. Or? So the headquarters of USGS is in Reston, Virginia, but there are multiple 
field centers in pretty much every state in the U.S. So in the USGS portfolio, do you also have custody of groundwater? And there is a lot of groundwater work, yes, and absolutely. Aquifers? Because that's one of the big issues as we move forward, especially out west, is the aquifers and the depletion of the aquifers. Yes, and, and particularly I know there's a large group in South Florida that looks at injecting back into aquifers as an idea of you know trying to keep them, but if you're injecting water, what are you putting down there that might affect the natural communities, the microbial communities? If you've suddenly added oxygen and nutrients that they haven't seen in a very long time, what could change? That's a big, it gives a whole new meaning to the word ecology. In case you're wondering, USGS is the United States Geological Survey. I bet some of you didn't know that. I had to look it up a long time ago. A lot of people tend to quickly read the four-letter acronym and confuse us with the Coast Guard. You'd be amazed how often that happens, especially when I'm at sea. Would you rather be in the Coast Guard? No. Okay. <laughs> so before we move on to your current work, what was the principal finding of your dissertation? Um, we were surprised to find that when I had isolated these bacteriophage from multiple geographic places, so Tampa Bay, which is on the Gulf Coast of Florida, the Florida Keys, um, and Hawaii, because we'd happen to have a trip out there for something else, that they were all very genetically close to each other. And in fact, that the Hawaii and Tampa Bay were more closely related than the one in Tampa Bay and the Florida Keys, which meant there really was this, you know, population that was sort of circumglobal of that virus. So I'm going to be your mother now. How did this happen? I mean, the ocean is big. Is, is it natural selection driving to uniformity? It could be that, or quite honestly, kind of what I thought might help it along was the fact that, you know, there are cruise ships and other ships that are in the Keys, that are in Tampa Bay, that are in Hawaii. Ballast water can move things quickly across vast distances, and that might help keep that genetic uniqueness, even though you've traveled a long way. So is ballast water really a four-letter word? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good title, That's though. always open for debate. It's a good title someday. <laughs> So I, I've been on many committees with Christina, and uh, allow me to re recall a, a comment you made at one of them. You said um, you had to switch from regular to caffeinated coffee. I, no, I think what, what you're thinking of is that in 1994, I switched to decaf for other people's safety. Right. <laughs> what kind of safety? Um, the intensity with which I approach everything from grocery shopping to my science is apparently at a higher level than many people are prepared to deal with. And so <laughs> taking caffeine out, I hoped to at least give a little bit of buffer so that people had a fighting chance. <laughs> because I, you can I'm scare people. Yes. In fact, I have been told I'm scary. <laughs> I also only drink decaf because I get a little bit too, uh, too much of a smart ass if I've had too much caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't need help with that, that either. <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little... Coral, okay? You do a lot of work on coral, so let's start with just some general basic stuff about corals, because I don't know much, and maybe I'll bet a lot of people here don't know. So what is a coral? I was going to say, I'm not sure how much I know about corals, because I pretty much just view them as a landscape for the microbes I'm interested in, but I'll, I'll do my <laughs> okay. best. It's okay. <laughs> so corals are animals that are colonial animals, and some of them are have make calcium carbonate skeletons, so mm -hmm. hard or stony corals. Others um, tend to have more proteinaceous or softer skeletons and look more like sea fans. And the tropical corals most people think of also have symbiotic algal buddies, but the bulk of the corals I study, which live in the deeper ocean, are in complete darkness, and they don't have algal symbionts. Complete darkness, so no photosynthesis can That's happen. That's right. Okay. But what, so what are the different components? You have the actual coral itself, the animal that makes the coral, what else is in there? That's called the holobiont or the whole thing Well, is... so the coral animal is that. The holobiont is the coral animal plus everything else. So bacteria, archaea, viruses, fungi, mm -hmm. algae if it's in a sunlit environment. How about so the... What do ahead. they eat if they're <laughs> in the dark? What are, what are they consuming as their carbon and energy source? So the ones that live in the dark... They're capture feeding, so they're hustling, grabbing, and consuming either small um, fragments, marine snow, or some of them can take up dissolved, you know, organic carbon. But they're, they're having to do it themselves, although I suspect that as a result, the 
non-photosynthetic microbes are doing more duty, helping them cycle nutrients and giving them access to mm -hmm. different carbon sources. And so as, as planet Earth is getting a little bit different, dare we say warmer, which could get you in trouble, um, what is actually going on with these poor animals that are sort of stuck? Are they beginning to starve or are they beginning to change? Well, so it depends on which corals you're talking about. So to me, from my perspective, so the cold water corals, which I tend to call deep sea just because I usually get them from the deep sea, but it's really the temperature that determines where they are. So most of them want to be between 4 and 10 degrees Celsius, so about the inside of your refrigerator. And so you can find some of them within scuba diving depths in the right places. So in Alaska, fjords, Norway, Chile... So these fjords might be the future diving hotspots because these corals, there's way more species of cold water corals than there are tropical corals. And in fact, tropical corals are sort of like the weird cousins that shacked up with these algae and then got very picky. They don't want to be too hot. They don't want to be too cold. It made them kind of fragile as, a, as in comparison to these other species. They're the Goldilocks ones. They are. So the, the coral reefs we think about when scuba diving, those are the, 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 the picky variety, right? Yes. Yeah. And the shallow ones are not the ones you work on. Is that right? I, I've done a little bit of work on shallow okay. ones, but the bulk of my work has deep been sea. deep sea. Yeah. Go ahead, Elio. Do the deep sea ones also make reefs? It depends. Most people, people do say they make reefs because part of the definition of reefs is sort of as a, an obstruction to shipping. They don't because of depth. But a lot of them do make sort of coral gardens if it's soft or the stony corals will make large branching mounds of three-dimensional structure that then fish and other invertebrates come to. So it is the same concept of biodiversity as you would see in a reef. Are they as beautiful as the other corals? They are. I have some pictures <laughs> of some of the reefs in the Aleutian Islands and you wouldn't know if I didn't tell you that this picture with all of these like orange and pink and purple sea fans and sponges and just, you know, invertebrates everywhere. If I didn't tell you where I was looking out the window of a submersible, you would think maybe you were diving in the Cayman Islands. Ever been diving, Elio? You ever dive? Yeah, uh, me? Are you kidding? <laughs> well, you live in San Diego. Yeah, okay. the water's cold out there. So the... Um... Uh, I don't want to put my life in jeopardy. That's true. Is every ocean have coral of some kind in it? Yes. Even the very, very cold ones way down? Even polar. polar. There, are, there are soft corals okay. that people have looked at. And what, what's the relationship between the, the corals and the fish? You, you just mentioned they eat off of it. Is that, what else? Do they do anything so definitely, else? So definitely the corals create habitat for the fish. So okay. a lot of these deep sea coral ecosystems are nurseries for even some commercial species of fish like orange ruffy. Okay. I don't know. Someone was asking me, you know, do... You know, is there more connection between them? You know, do the fish do something that benefits the corals? And I hadn't really thought about it, but it's certainly possible because, like I said, especially with these branching species where some of the fish actually, like, burrow deep in there, you know, maybe they eat some, you know, mm -hmm. encrusting mm -hmm. worms and invertebrates that otherwise would hamper coral growth. Like, there could be various types of symbioses at that right. level. Right, And do we know in geological time when corals started on Earth? So I looked it up because I thought you might ask this, even though I deal in microbiology time scales, so 20 minutes to an hour, so I had to go look. So according to the Googles, uh, corals were first started being in the fossil record in the Cambrian, but they didn't really mm. sort of take off until a little bit later in the Ordovician. Okay. Remind us how many millions of years ago is that? 400 to 500. A lot of things happen at the time, right? Plants emerged, yeah. And today, how long will the coral last? How many years? A year, two years, thousands? Um, depends on where it is and, of course, what it's putting up with. But, for example, there was a black coral that I collected in the Gulf of Mexico on one research cruise, which my USGS colleague Nancy Prouty aged, and it was over 2,000 years old. 2,000 years old. Older than Alio. <laughs> How well, anybody is. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, we, we think of terrestrial species, and what you immediately think of is the California redwoods being yeah, some of the yeah. longest lived biological entities. But corals, you know, if it's just 2,000 years old and it was a generic coral, it wasn't one of those, you know, magnificent trees mm. just sitting there. I mean, it's longer than, you know, humans probably have been around. So are there problems with all corals at this time? Are they endangered? Tell us a little bit about that. 
so, I mean, one thing, when, when people ask me in general, it's like, are, are there going to be corals in, in 20 years? Mm -hmm. You know, my answer is always yes. They just not, might not be the corals you're thinking of. So certainly shallow water tropical corals are having lots of problems between bleaching events and nutrient pollution. They're really, there's a lot of both global and local stressors that mm -hmm. hit most of them. The deep sea corals, I think, are still fortunate in that they're buffered. So, you know, they're usually some distance off of shore and then the depth. And so that is giving them some level of protection. And also being in the deep sea, the temperature variability isn't there yet. Got it. So the, the bleaching happens when the algae leave? Hmm? And what causes that to happen? Usually temperature. temperature. Also sometimes just the amount of light, but normally temperature. All right. So again, those are the corals most people think of, the shallow water that are having issues, but the deep sea are better off. Uh, but no one can really see those, and they don't make fancy pictures and so forth. So more, There have been more and more. I would say probably in the last 10 years, there, yeah. there's been a big, you know, not out of sight or out of mind anymore to make people realize they're there. But yes, it's not as easy to go encounter them as it is the tropical reefs. So deep sea coral needs some uh, PR, some good PR, right? I'm working on You're it. You're working on it, yes, you are. That's what we're doing here. I'm eager to hear about how you see those deep corals, but I, I think that you're going to get to that. Yeah, well, well, what she does with them. How, how she gets to yeah, see them. Yeah, we're going to get there. I have a few more questions. Um, so what would happen if all the shallow corals were destroyed? What would be the effect? There would be no more Charleston. Oh, Michael, you'd have to come to New York. I'd have to come. Well, there may not be New York. Why wouldn't there be... Um, they're controlling sea level. Yeah. I mean, you know, barrier islands serve a very, very important feature. Is he right? He is right. I mean, that's one of, one of the reasons the U.S. Geological Scary, Survey, geology, it? is interested okay. in coral reefs is as a storm buffer because it okay. is incredibly important. Now, what about your deep sea corals? If they all went away, what would happen? I can't even imagine how many. It would be so many cascading effects. Like I said, I mean, at one it, one thing, they are nurseries for a lot of commercial fish, and so I think there would be a big chunk of food source that would vanish. In terms of biodiversity, there are hot spots of biodiversity in the deep ocean. I'm not, I can't even predict what mm, the effects right. of just removing okay. that would be. So, in general, what can, what can we do to prevent the degradation of all corals? Well... Deep sea corals, I think, are Vote. somewhat easier. Vote. <laughs> Vote. Deep sea corals are somewhat yeah. easier in that the main threats to them right now are, are us. So not trawl mm -hmm. fishing. So going back to lines as opposed to trawls, which tend to be these huge nets with you know, metal that gets dragged along the bottom and can, in an hour, obliterate thousands of years of corals that will not come back in our lifetime. Yeah, so yeah. you know, phasing out trawl fishing... Um, being more careful with oil and gas exploration. In fact, a lot of my work is funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management because we go out and survey where are these coral ecosystems and characterize them and determine how unique they are so that then BOEM can decide how much of a buffer they need to put around these ecosystems when they're leasing blocks mm -hmm. for undersea exploration of oil and gas. Okay. So in the Gulf of Mexico, there are these constant oil seeps. So do, do the deep sea coral like oil? I don't know that they like oil. They don't necessarily Does, seem can to. Can they use it? It doesn't seem so. So okay. interestingly, when I've done some um, bacterial surveys, there were a lot of bacteria associated with the coral microbiome that certainly have the potential to degrade oil. However, when I did metagenomics and looked to see is there functional genes that show this is actually happening, I didn't find any. And other people who had looked at stable isotopes to see if they could see a signature being incorporated in the coral from hydrocarbons also didn't find any. So I think, if anything, they, they, just, they don't use it as a carbon source. Maybe they have a reserve to detoxify if it, they get too much. Cool. I have one more question before we move on. And if you have coral questions, get them ready, please. Uh, is there a lot of research into corals going on? So the USGS, obviously, but do other organizations? Do hey, certainly, NOAA does a great NOAA. deal of coral research, both in shallow and deep sea ecosystems. Okay. Any questions on coral before? Uh, let me let me say something. Yes, sir. First of all, there's a fantastic book that was written, which is called "Corals in the Microbial Sea," and the author is right here. He's not paying attention, yes. but there he is. He's trying to hide in the crowd, but we all know who he is. <laughs> Forest <laughs> roar. Uh, I, I do have a question, a microbiological question for you, though. Um, I am very taken by the studies that show the effect of bacteria on the development of animal creatures, like tube worms. 
bacteria necessary for the larval development of tube worms and other things. Uh, is there something like it in corals? And I would say yes, from studies that have been done in tropical environments as well as elsewhere, the microbial composition of biofilms on the bottom definitely determines where corals decide to settle and then metamorphose from mobile larvae into the sedentary adult corals. And certainly they don't develop as normally if they don't have their microbiome. All right, any coral questions? We got a, Ray, we got one behind you. Oh, we're turn it on. Hear. He's going to turn it on. Hello. So what is the maximum depth that the coral can survive? You mentioned ocean depth. So what is the maximum depth that it can survive? So not so much coral reef, but species of corals. There are cold water corals that live as deep as thousands of meters deep. Oh, I already sent one to her. Send it back. I sent I send one. Right here, give it to someone else here who's going to ask a question. There. He's got it's, his. It's very dangerous here. I'm sorry. We have a question Hello. here. Ray. Oh. oh, you got one? Okay, yes. sorry. Uh, what's the effect of the plastic bags and the plastic that accumulates in the ocean on... Uh, Ooh, plastic. On the deep sea... Deep sea Hold corals. the microphone. Closer. Deep, okay, deep sea uh, corals Close. versus the, the shallow sea corals. So you would think that because deep sea corals in general are further offshore and much deeper that you wouldn't see these same impacts. And I would argue they are probably... Cumulatively, it's probably less... But we do, on almost every trip that we go out using an ROV, we always do see trash, including plastic bags. I actually once saw, in the middle of a bunch of tube worms at 9,000 feet deep in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a Budweiser beer can wedged right in the middle of the bush. Oh, my. Uh, so our trash definitely does make it out, even to very, very deep ocean waters. What's an ROV? A remotely operated vehicle. Okay. I have one of those. Was there another question? You're done? Yes. Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, thank you. I have a quick question. How do the uh, lava cores, how do they locate the biofilms? Like, how do they locate them when they're swimming through the oceans? I don't know. I have to assume that there's um, chemical cues that the bacteria in the biofilm are putting off that the larvae recognize and use to triangulate to get to them. Gives a whole new meaning to the word quorum sense, our words quorum sensing. <laughs> she's, I, been, she's been trying since we started. Yeah. <laughs> microphone? There you go. Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether or not it's possible to closer. almost... Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, whether it's possible to culture uh, corals. If, you're having, if you were taking samples from uh, the deeper sea, is it possible to recreate conditions on the surface such that you could grow them or study them in an artificial environment? So I know a lot of people have been trying to see if they could create a coral tissue culture with varying amounts of success. Um, people have managed to maintain some cold water coral species in aquaria to do mesocosm type studies. And then people have also started using um, exaptasia, which are you know, these tiny little hydra as a coral model, just because it's easier to keep them in, in tanks and you can get you know, genetically identical ones so you can standardize what you're working on. One more, yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, I read recently that Australia has just invested some money to try to remediate uh, some of the damage that's happened in the Great Barrier Reef. How realistic are the prospects of, of trying to rebuild a, a, such a complex ecosystem like that? I think it's less about rebuilding than it is if we don't get in there and do something, then there aren't any. And so there, we have to take some steps, especially to try and mediate local stressors, which I think we have more control over versus global stressors. But they can't take all of it all at once. Sorry. It's under the chair there. All right. You know, I got to say, look at this. They're still here. Yesterday at TWIV, they left after 10 minutes. I told you corals were sexy. <laughs> Did you? Yes, several times. You just didn't listen. I didn't listen, I guess. Because they didn't have virus in well, it. Viruses are sexy, too. And you yeah. worked on them. I did, so and got, there are viruses got, and corals, so it's, oh. it's double duty. And you work on those as well? It, no, because it's taken me a while to convince the USGS that bacteria in corals are important, and okay. it'll probably take me another decade to work up the viruses that infect bacteria in corals are important. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about wait, your wait, research. Wait a minute, hold on. Yes, sir. Are there any coral viruses, genuine coral viruses? I think they are, but Becky Vega-Thurber is the one that's leading the charge in figuring out who those are mm. and, and identifying them for us. 
So the actual coral animal, you want to know if there's a virus of that, okay. It, surely okay. there is, right? Mm -hmm. If there's an animal or if there's anything, any living entity, there's a virus for it. <laughs> yeah, and the, the algae as well, there are viruses of those, right? Yes. Yeah. And okay, so let's talk about your research. First of all, uh, you say you're looking at the microbial associates of tropical and cold water corals and their surrounding habitat. That's from your website. So if it's not right, it's your fault, I guess. Of course. You're, what is your group? Like, what is it composed of? How big is it? And what are the different kinds of people that are in it? So I really need to work on diversity. Right now, my group is three people, myself, um, another PhD technician, and a recently graduated undergraduate. We are all white women under 5'3". So I understand that I desperately need to work on my diversity. <laughs> I'm not sure the height matters. Well, it does because my last master's student was six feet tall and she put everything in the high shelves and all of us have to keep getting on step stools to get to our equipment. That's a good reason. And right? it's easier to fit in submersibles if you're smaller. Actually, it is. It's like being a jockey. Being petite is, is a plus. And how much of that do you do, submersible work? Um, I've done more than 10 submersible dives and two different submersibles, and we've mostly transitioned to using remotely operated vehicles just because you can operate them longer thanks to the tether to the ship and get more objectives done. But in mm -hmm. August, I'm going on a research cruise with the submersible Alvin, which I haven't been in yet, and I'm really excited. Could you tell us more about these submersibles? I only have a vague idea. How big are they? How long are you out there? Do they have windows? Yes, yes, they have windows. So the first submersible I ever went in was called the Delta, and it literally looks like the little yellow submarine that you see on, like, the Beatles poster. And there's room for two people. So the scientist is laying in the fetal position on their side, looking out a porthole. And if this is the scientist, I'm going to show you, the pilot is sitting above you. Which made me a little nervous because it was clear to me the only opening is above him. And so if something goes wrong, I'm not getting out because he is between me and the door. <laughs> I much preferred the Johnson Sea Link, which had a really big acrylic bubble. And so it was like being open because you had, you know, 180 degrees of visibility. And in that case, a pilot and a scientist are in the front in the bubble. And then there's a second separate compartment in the back, which has portholes that also has sort of a backup pilot and a second scientist. And you, did you learn the wonder of plexiglass and review your physics about pressure and implosion and all those other things? So it's funny you say that. When the first time I was going out, I really, I don't know why, but I assumed that, you know, they wouldn't let me go down in this. Like, surely you sort of give them a takeout order of, here, I want these samples, and then someone goes and gets it. And when they told me I was going, my husband and I watched some, some videos and there was one with one of the Russian submersibles where there was like a pinhole prick and literally the water pressure coming through it sort of sliced people in half. And that made him a little anxious about it. But as soon as we got in, because of the view, any concerns I had were just gone. I was so being able to see things and knowing I was seeing an environment that no one had ever looked at before. And then, of course, there's not just my objectives, but a bunch of other people's. There's always a bunch of stuff to do. And you usually only have about four hours of battery time because you're not attached to the ship to go out and get this all done and get back. So last year at this meeting on TWIV, you had an astronaut. So this year we That's have right. an aquanaut. You read my mind, Michael. Yes. How did you do that? Uh, you know, we've been hanging around for a while. <laughs> That's right. So how, what's the deepest that you go? Uh, the deepest I've been so far is 2,700 feet. Okay. Now, it, does it get warm inside this uh, vehicle? Um, no, actually, it, typically there's just enough air conditioning to keep the electronics cool, but because it's very cold outside, you usually yeah. end up in sweatshirts to stay warm during yeah. the duration of the dive. What's the temperature of the water down there? I said four to ten degrees Celsius. Okay. All right. Now, are you, as you said, you're trending towards remotely operated vehicles, so you'll be doing less and less of this sort of it, activity. It, it's, it's basically availability. So there's mm -hmm. many more remotely operated vehicles available for use than there are submersibles, and so it's you know all about timing, lining up the ship and the asset, either a sub yeah, or an yeah. RV, to work when everybody's available. So just to clarify, a remotely operated vehicle, you would stay on the ship and then just use a keyboard to tell it what to do. Yes. Yeah, so those there's a tether that comes back to the ship, so you always have to be sure you don't get that wrapped around something and pretty much we're sitting in almost like a container and so there's a pilot and a navigator and then the scientist and there's all these big screens and so everyone is watching live what the cameras on the RV are seeing to direct it where to move and how to sample. So yeah. when you go to Denny's you're really good at getting the prizes out of the... <laughs> no, no, the pilots do that and some of them are incredible. I mean they could play cards with these you know manipulators. It's incredible the skills they develop. 
So these are all owned by the U.S. government, correct? Or they um, are they leased or? No, was... so I'm trying to think. So Alvin is from Woods Hole, and okay. I think some of the RVs we've used were University of Connecticut. So no, usually they're either a university or a consortium asset. Okay. Probably funded by the National Science Foundation or one of the other granting agencies. All right. So now you, you take these wonderful trips down there. By the way, do you have movies of, or videos uh, yes. on your website? Or where can we it's see Not them? on the website. I, I have... Yeah. If I dug through, it's mostly on small digital tapes, but you're right, I should dig out some of the ones because, yes, especially early on because I was just a total geek, I would t the camera's on an arm, and at the end of the dive, I would turn it around so it could see me inside the sphere going like this, so I probably should fish some of those out. Deep sea selfies. Yes. So just like in drones where every drone manufactured today is 4K video, I have your, rem your remote accessible devices gone to 4K video? I think they have, and especially since a lot of the um, NOAA cruises, like on the Okeanos Explorer, are doing live streams. And so they literally, what's being captured by the video camera is being transmitted over satellite. And so I'm sitting in my office watching it, and I'm seeing it in real time, just like the people on the ship. Wow. That's cool. All right, so what are you looking for when you go down in these ships? Like I said, usually on these cruises, because it is so incredibly expensive, I mean, so for a, a blue water research cruise with either an RV or a submersible, you're looking at at least $50,000 a day. So there's normally, you know, between 10 and 20 principal investigators, each with multiple objectives who are on this cruise. And so for each dive, there's priorities. And so you're trying to juggle, okay, all right, yes, I'm looking for coral samples. So I'm looking for this species and this species, but we also need to try and grab, you know, a couple invertebrate crabs for that person. And then if we have time at the end, we're going to run a transect so someone can do biodiversity assays later. And so you always have a list of all the things you're trying to achieve. What's a transect? Starting at point A and with the camera going to point B at a specific speed so that someone later can watch that video and look at, identify as many things as possible ah. along the way. Okay. So you take samples of corals themselves, yes. right? And the water down there as well? Or Sometimes water samples, yes. And and is there a separate gadget to collect the water, I imagine, and to collect the solid? Yes, so sometimes they actually have um, Niskin bottles on the outside of the ROV. So they're bottles that the ends are open, and then when you um, fire them, the ends snap closed, and you capture the water inside. Some of them have suction, and they'll actually suck the water up into a container. So the size of the water sample could be anything, but the size of a solid is limited by the tentacle? Um, more limited by the size of the containers and by the amount of containers you can carry. So for each dive, depending on what your objective is, you set up these sort of little workspace in front of the sub with containers that are right for whatever it is you're collecting. And give us an idea of sizes. So the coral samples I usually collect are going to be maybe about the size of my finger or a little more. And that's usually enough tissue for me to do microbiology and to also then share with a colleague that does population genetics and another colleague that does reproduction. So we get multiple data information out of each piece that we collect. How do you snap the piece off the coral? Different techniques. Sometimes with, if the guy's really good with that manipulator arm, it's sort of like a claw, and so you can just grab and snap. Other times we found it's better to take the suction, sort of snap it off with the end, but with the suction hold it, and then bring it over and drop it in. So we've developed a couple techniques. Boy, not easy. It's not. It looks easy because they make it look easy like ballet yeah, dancers, right. but it's very difficult. Sure. I feel and like... How many, uh, excuse me, how many samples of coral would you typically get in one, in one trip? Um... For me, because I'm, according to my colleagues, the prima donna, because I want each coral in an individual container, not touching <laughs> anything else, not for contamination, you know, maybe 10. Whereas my colleague that does population genetics and therefore doesn't have a problem, like maybe stacking more than one, she'll tr sometimes try and get 30 or 50. I, f I, I feel like these field studies require us to ask you because, you know, I wouldn't ask someone, uh, how do you pipette small volumes of liquid in the laboratory, right? <laughs> but because you do something that's unique, we don't know it at all. So we ask you these details and I, I find it really fascinating. Um, so you have to plan out each excursion very carefully. Yes. So before we go in the, in the field, so again, that cruise that's in August, everybody's already submitted Here's, you know, here's my priorities in order of the most important thing, the next, the next, mm. how many samples of what and how. Because again, going out, you have your perfect situation where the weather is, is glorious and so you get all the dives you had planned and that rarely actually happens. You've got to know that, okay, 
we may have 12 dives, but then bad weather could reduce that or you know, a problem with the ship or a problem with the asset could delay us. And so if we lose dives, how do we shuffle everybody's objectives to still try and get the maximum we can out of that cruise? So I'm really interested in how this team of intense scientists works that out on the fly. Is there one person that's in charge of coordinating? There those is. There's always a chief scientist who has to be the final, you know, arbitrator. And so yes, there there's group discussions, but in the end there has to be one person who makes the decision and communicates with the ship's crew so it's not chaos. And for those of you listening at home, Vincent pointed to Chris as the chief scientist. I would say you make all the decisions. I think no, have, I'm rarely the chief scientist on these giant, you know, why not? You should be. Cruises. I think you have the perfect personality to be coordinating everything and making sure things happen. I think this suits you very well, right? Funny you say that. In high school, I took one of those aptitude tests and one of the top scores for me was drill sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could that's, sort of... That's uh, in the <laughs> job description of all good PIs. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and finally, how many times a year do you do this, the sampling? Typically, it, um, on, you know, my projects tend to be on like four or five year cycles. And so usually the first two years will be the collection years. And so during collection years, mm -hmm. we'll usually go to sea once for two to three weeks. Okay. All right. So now when you, you bring these samples back to the lab and everyone then can do things, you have water, you have animals of various sorts. What are you looking for? So pretty much we, you know, yank all the DNA out and then mm -hmm. start interrogating it for whatever we're looking for. We yank all the DNA out. That's great. <laughs> and you sequence it. Yes. So that's, that's what drives your program mainly, metagenomics, right? Amplicon and metagenomics. Okay. So yes, figuring out who's there and then what they're doing. So what are you finding, for example? What, what do you, you, so, you, if you sample the animals, the coral animals themselves, what do you find? So pretty much we find out who's in there first. So many of these deep sea coral species have never been looked at for microbiology. And so mm. to me, it's, it's critically important to go out and catalog these baseline microbiomes of who's there because they haven't been as impacted mm -hmm. as tropical corals. And to me, having that baseline, one, just for biodiversity interest, but also if something happens, if there is an oil spill or you know, a sedimentation event, how would you know what to remediate back to if you didn't know what the system looked like when it was unperturbed? And so having that information or also being able to use changes in the microbiome to notice sublethal effects on these corals. Because right now, both tropical or deep sea, your metrics tend to be the coral's alive or the coral's dead. And mortality is not a very um, sensitive indicator. And so using the microbiome, if you know what it looks like when it's functional and you suddenly see dramatic shifts towards certain other taxa, that could clue you in that something's changing before the coral actually looks sick or drops dead. How complex are they? Are they like our gut where there's, you know, a thousand to 10,000 yes. species? Uh, for bacteria, absolutely. And like I said, we're just starting with metagenomics to get at the archaea, the fungi, the viruses, the other components, but bacteria-wise, definitely is complex. Now, all of this is culture-independent, right? I, it is. I have done a little bit of culture okay. work. It's just, you Tell know... Tell us about it. It's, it's difficult because you never know what media is the right media. But in fact, there's been one particular sequence that's consistently coming up in many of my deep-sea corals, and so oh. I'm going to take a shot at trying to culture it out on these cruises okay. by using selective media. Do you have to use high pressure in order to get the organisms to grow since they're growing at depth at, you know, 2,500 atmospheres? There are probably some where it matters, but the majority, not so much. So again, if, if there's air somewhere, like in fish swim bladders, you don't do well when you get brought up to the surface, but the corals don't mind. So the corals, the crabs, worms, like there's plenty of things we bring up from the deep sea with no, temp, with no pressure um, effects. effects. And so the bacteria as well, why would they care? <laughs> That's true. So you, you mentioned dead corals. So do you sometimes get samples and you're, they're visibly dead and you didn't know that when they were, when they were collected? And no, normally they are very much alive they're when they come alive. up. They're never, they're never dead. Well, they would, if they were, they'd be already dead when we collected them. Right. So and you would I, know that. Yeah, right? I would know before oh, we picked okay. them up. So in terms of the bacterial members or species or at whatever level, what, are there any surprises or is it all pretty much what you would expect? Well, again, with each one, so each coral that we look at has a different microbiome. And so, you know, since I'm usually the, this is the first time someone's looked at that microbiome, it's all new. Okay. I mean, you know, I never know what, you know, combination we're going to see in each coral's microbiome because each one tends to be different. 
And how stable are they? Do you go back to the same site, you know, three months later, and then the profile is still the same? So typically not. There isn't a lot of temporal studies in the deep sea just because it is so expensive, and so you don't usually get a lot of opportunities to go back to the same place more than once. Early on, we did go to at least one site several times, and so I did have some level of, of temporal, and it did seem relatively stable. But again, small, small sample numbers. So can you tell us some kinds of bacteria that you find? So even in, in cold water corals, you do still find vibrios. Okay. And so they're not just pathogens. They're part of the, the natural microbiome of corals. Mm -hmm. um, actinobacteria, which are known as a, an interest for bioprospecting, you definitely find those. So a lot of proteobacteria, but then actinobacteria. And then it, some other you know, things that are scientific names that I don't even try and pronounce correctly because I've never even heard someone else say them, but as we do more and more mm -hmm. molecular mm -hmm. work, you start seeing these groups pop up, but usually only at the family level because we don't know what they are well enough to get lower than that. So, you, and you mentioned every coral is different. So how many different kinds of corals are there? Like I said, I, I know there's more species of cold water corals than tropical, but I don't know how, how many? many hundreds. Okay. And, so, and, uh, one of the things that everyone, is, after last evening's talk from the assistant director of the CDC, do these microbes associated with the coral make antimicrobials? Yes. So have we begun to mine the antimicrobials and are they addressing the usual suspects for targets like DNA, RNA synthesis, protein synthesis, et cetera? So in the, I would say, early 2000s, um, Harbor Branch was the, the center for that. So Shirley Pomponi, mostly targeting sponges and some other invertebrates, but a little bit of the corals, had a huge program looking exactly at that, culturing things and scanning them to try and find out what they could impact. I've cultured some things early on and, in fact, um, had small collaborative agreements with companies that then wanted to grow up whatever I had in culture from this environment and test them against anything. So not only just for antimicrobial drugs, but could they be, you know, derived enzymes, you know, all kinds of things. What could they use them for? Now, uh, the surface corals are subject to a lot of diseases. That's why they're in trouble. And bacteria account for a lot of that. How about the deep ones? Do they have diseases? So far, no one has observed a disease in a deep sea coral. There's been a couple, what I would call shallow water, cold water corals, again, within scuba diving depths. And there's been a, a one or two reports of diseases at that level. But again, they're subject to temperature fluctuations. The true deep sea corals, no one's seen one. But again, the ocean is vast. It could be happening unless we dropped you know, down and happened to be looking at that one, we wouldn't see it. So that's the good news, I guess. So far, so good, yes. Like I said, I think that distance and depth buffers them from a lot of, of our mess. <laughs> you mentioned wanting to look at we change. May end up, we may end up in the depth of the sea, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. You, you want to see the changes over time in the microbiome. So that means you have to sample for long periods of time and compare. Because right now, you don't have any archival samples to look at and compare to what you're getting now, right? Correct. So you don't know if there have been any changes. Right, no, I, for each time that, you know, if, it's, if I'm the first person to look at a given coral's microbiome, which in yeah, these yeah. cases I often you am, are. you know, I am starting the baseline wherever I am right now. Now, when you look at these sequences, can you also see viral contigs there? Um, from metagenomics, yes. Yeah, so that's one way to determine, you know, what the virome is of these corals and so forth. And you're interested in that as well, right? Sure, and from the, the metagenome that I had presented a poster on here, of the viral sequences that we got, very much like tropical corals, about 80 to 90% of them were bacteriophage viruses. And then mm -hmm. we had, you know, there were also virus, viral families that infect archaea and then a bunch of eukaryotic viruses that presumably are infecting the coral, fungi, protists, whatever else is there. Any, mm -hmm. any herpes viridae? <laughs> Alle herpes viridae, I found. <laughs> yeah, there have been some herpes viridae reported before in corals, right? Yes. Do we know what they infect? The assumption is that they are infecting the, the coral. coral animal. Yeah. Poor corals. <laughs> Did someone down there have a question? No, you're okay. Do we have any questions about Christina's research? There's a question back there. I have one more swine flu left. Uh, I was just curious about the regulation of this. So you mentioned that it's uh, really expensive to do multiple visits to the same coral, but if you could, would you be allowed to sort of do an interventional study and 
test whether or not a little bit more iron in a particular location would have an effect on the corals or maybe increase the amount of CO2 or, you know, uh, carbonate or whatever that's uh, in this particular region? Or is that international law says that you can't actually touch any of these? Uh, international law and or, or common sense. I mean, the, the humans have a long history of going, hey, let's try adding just this thing and destabilizing everything. So no, people would do those kind of experiments in mesocosms. They wouldn't be able to just go offshore and start <laughs> experimenting in a large scale. Sure. Good throw. Sure. Kind of. Anything else? Where I'm running now. Hey, so I was wondering kind of about the establishment of the microbiome in the coral. You mentioned that like the larvae colonize a biofilm originally. Um, is that, was I understanding that correctly? So deep sea corals like tropical corals, there's some that are, are brooders that keep the larvae, you know, inside others that are just broadcast spawners. Okay. And so some of the brooders do seem to vertically transmit at least some microbes. Okay, yeah, that's but most what I was them, getting at. Yeah. Because it's, it's spawning, they're picking up their microbiome from, from the environment. Cool. I don't know that there's been enough studies to tell us when exactly it happens. I think probably during the free swimming larval stage, they get some, but I think most gets established after they settle and are starting to become adults. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, uh, Hold it there. Uh, marine microbiology is notoriously hard field to get established in. Do you have any advice for um, individuals looking to get into that field at all? So something I didn't do and have always wished I had and therefore make it a priority is undergraduate research opportunities. So when I was an undergrad, I, you know, I worked clerically as work study and now, you know, realize I could have gotten such a jump if I'd really gotten to try things then. And so I try and encourage people to, you know, do internships, you know, find, find a lab that's doing something you're interested in, contact them and see if you can't just get a taste of it because it really helps. And like my postdoc where I really thought I wanted to do X and then when I was doing it realized, you know, I, I really don't like this as much. So I think it's not only does it help you by giving you an edge of, look, I've already started working in this, which is great on a resume. But if you try it and then find out, hey, I really don't like this. I've had some people who were all gung-ho, and after being in my lab for a while, went, yeah, this molecular biology is tedious and boring, and I hate this. And I'm like, I would rather you found that out now than after you've moved across the country and spent money to enroll in grad school. So try it before you buy it. Christine, is there anything about your research that we haven't touched on that you'd like to talk about? You can say no if you wish. Well, no, because I know Michelle's got some other exciting stuff she wants to talk about. I actually wanted to follow up on that question. It sounds like if you're, um, all your genome sequence data is now publicly available, there should be mm -hmm. a huge database for other people to do in silico experiments. So a great opportunity for bioinformatics. Absolutely. Yeah. And well, yeah, so the government is a huge fan of open data. And so I have to make all of the data publicly available and put yeah. it out there so that other people can work with it as well. And related to that, we recently did a TWIM on drug discovery through bioinformatic, a bioinformatic pipeline, looking for particular um, signatures that are known to be important for developing like polyketides and other molecules. Oh, so, super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that should be mentioned is that microbiology has become such an integrative science that every branch of microbiology speaks to every other branch. So there's no such thing as marine microbiology in, in isolation. It is part and parcel of a much bigger scheme. And that, I think, is also the good. And that was one of the exciting things that came out here at this meeting with Sharon, <clears throat> excuse me, Sharon Peacock's keynote talk of the first evening where she was saying, you get an isolate, you sequence it, it goes into the pipeline, you go throw it into the cloud, and then you determine what antibiotic resistance pattern it has. But at the same time, you could imagine that same concept working with these other animals, you know, having a cloud pipeline that could effectively dissect some of the organisms that are affiliated with the coral. And as we begin to learn from our clinical colleagues of all the cool stuff they can do with these bioinformatic pipelines, we should, you know, shamelessly co-opt the, these, these activities because you can really advance the discipline. 
and you were saying earlier that, you know, the deep sea corals need, you know, more PR. Yeah, well, they do. along those lines, I'm going to do some PR. So I am later this afternoon. So at 3 p.m. in room B203, I'm doing part of the Upgoer 5 session. Mm -hmm. And so I will be talking about my deep sea coral research. But because you can only use the 1,000 most common words, those words do not include coral or ocean or bacteria or DNA. So that should be interesting. It's going to be fun. Great. All right, Christina, what's a typical day for Christina Kellogg? It's decaf coffee. Yes, that's true. <laughs> it, it depends on the time, and that's one of the things I really love about my job is the variety. So some days I am sitting at the computer all day because I have data analysis, I have papers to write, I have proposals to write. But then, you know, field days, so some days, you know, I might be out on a ship, you know, in blue water right. for up to two weeks doing that, which is, you know, the really photogenic part of it. Um, sometimes I'm in the lab. I still do get to go in my lab sometimes and do the actual, you know, bench work. And sometimes you're at meetings like this one. Yes. All right. Do you ever wish you'd done something else? No. We know you didn't want to do industry for sure, but you don't ever wish you were in academics? No. I, I laugh at how lucky I was because I didn't know where I was going. I, you know, I had this sort of concept of mm. what the components of my dream job would be. But because at the time it was less common when I was a grad student to sort of introduce people to pathways other than standard academia, I didn't realize that a government job really was exactly what I wanted. There's enough freedom within our mission for me to study things that interest me. There's enough internal funding. I certainly don't have a lot, but I have enough to do what I'm interested in without having to spend a third or more of my time writing proposals and chasing money, which I think is, is fantastic not to have to spend that time. And I'm fortunate in that our office is on a university campus, and so I have a courtesy appointment there, and so I can easily have graduate students, yeah. and I have undergrads mm -hmm. that come to me from three or four different local institutions, and so I have the ability to interact with students, but by my choice, as opposed to having to teach or having to interact. I can right. pull them in when I have time and can really give them face time and an opportunity. So, so as an employee of the U.S. government, do you have an obligation to do some science communication to the public at all? I don't know that the that my employer considers it an obligation. I certainly do. Okay, because you know if you get certain kinds of NSF grants, you have to communicate. You have to have a communication component of the grant. Right, and actually, um, one of the sessions I went to here, Mark Martin and Katie Elliott did a fantastic session about communicating in creative ways your microbial world, and I got a lot of great tips out of that for the proposal I'm currently writing for ship time from an outside organization, and they want to know what is your, what's unique about your communication plan, and that was really helpful to develop that. Ship time, I like that. Ship time with Christina Kellogg. The Aquanaut. <laughs> yes, Michelle. So one of our guests asked about um, plastic in the ocean. Uh, we Many of you may have seen the story about the whale that died in Spain, and it brought to the surface, what, 75 pounds of plastic in its, in its gut? Yeah, it was crazy. Um, so, again, you do feel an obligation as a scientist to be an educator. Can you also be an advocate for conservation and, and green technology, or, or do you have to be careful about that because of your position? Because of my position, you know, the USGS is known for providing unbiased science, and so we are not supposed to lobby or advocate. We do our work, we provide the information, and other people make regulatory decisions. That said, I've certainly, I've been inspired by one of my undergrad students who is passionate about getting straws out of the waste stream and who, you know, went in the field with me and whipped out her stainless steel straw because she wasn't going to have this and made me really sensitive to how many times straws are just putting glasses in front mm -hmm. of you when people don't even want them. So that is depressing news, but I'm reminded that there is, um, there are bacteria that have been discovered that have enzymes that can break down plastics. And so maybe the microbes will um, mm. take care of all the filth that we've generated as humans. So my yes, last, sorry, go ahead. We could help them out by using better alternatives so they can catch up. <laughs> so my last question is U.S. What is, what is the number? The letters U.S. G.S. G.S. Yeah, I already forgot. Is this a career, a reasonable career option for microbiology people to consider, or is it too rare that they shouldn't even think about it? Uh, no, there's, there's more of us hiding in the USGS than you would think. Um, the title, people's titles aren't necessarily microbiologists, but they are doing microbiology. But again, because microbiology, as Ilio pointed out, is so interdisciplinary, they might, their title might be 
hydrologist or biogeochemist or something else, but there is microbiology happening in our ecosystems mission area, like I said, wildlife disease, or in the water mission area, looking at water quality. So it's, it's in a bunch of places. It might not necessarily be tagged microbiology, but there are a ton of microbiologists working in different facets of USGS. Okay, very good. Anything else? Well, I wonder why is that, what's this book doing here? What is that book doing there? Yeah. No, what is it, Elio? What book is it? I have no idea. I never heard of it. It's Microbe, and two of the authors are right here. Over here. And you can the buy senior it. Senior author. You can. It's a wonderful textbook of microbiology, and you can buy it at the ASM bookstore Cheap. here. Cheap. 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 Inexpensive. Tell, tell oh. us. Tell us what sets this book apart. The tone that you you and Fred established years ago. Well. We thought of writing a book that dealt with uh, the principles that are behind microbiology, not just the facts. And so it has that flavor of trying to figure out the deeper meaning of things. I don't know that that explains it, so mm. why don't you buy it and look, find out for yourself. <laughs> Shamelessly well, plugging. It, each chapter does start with a case that tells a microbiology story, a real life story, and then we get into the science behind that. All right, so you've been watching an episode of This Week in Microbiology. You can find it on asm.org. It's one of many different podcasts we do, This Week in Virology, Parasitism, Immunology, uh, Evolution, and you can subscribe to all of them for free. Okay, you can go, go to your iPhone. If you have an iPhone, there's an app called Podcasts on it. If you just go there, open the app, so you search for TWIM or TWIV or TWIP or Immune or TWIVO, you will find it. Please subscribe. The more of you who subscribe, the better for us. It really helps us to have numbers to show that we're engaging people. And it's totally free. You automatically get every episode, and you will love it. And obviously, you love TWIM because you're all here. Uh, you might try the other ones as well. Your if, mission is to go out and find five additional subscribers. That would be great. You're probably already subscribing, but, you know, recruit your friends, neighbors, mothers, fathers, grandparents. Is it... There's they all a, love it. There's a good chance that there's some non-subscribers here, so we may, we may get them. And also, if you are a subscriber already and you love what we do, consider supporting us. It allows us to travel and do more work, video work, for example. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways you can do that. You could buy a t-shirt. You could do Patreon. You could give us a dollar a month and a couple of other things as well. We would appreciate it. And, you know, on every show, we have email from our listeners you can send email to twim at microbe.tv. We'll read it on the show, and one of uh, our wonderful co-hosts who know all about microbiology will answer uh, your questions. Our guest today has been Christina Kellogg. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It was great to be here. Coral is sexy. That, that really needs to be the title, I guess. Coral is sexy with <laughs> Christina Kellogg. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan, and as of July 1, will be the president of ASM. Thank you, Yay. Michelle. Round of applause. Thank you. Elio Schechter. Some presidents are terrific. <laughs> Elio Schechter is at the wonderful blog, Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for allowing us to do not only this, but supporting us. I want to thank Ray Ortega, Yay. our producer, hey, Ray. who does amazing work. And I would like to thank Ronald Jenkins for the music that you hear on TWIM. Is there anything else? Am I forgetting? Uh, I think something? you got to do something about those oh, T-shirts on the, on the table, Vincent. Christina, toss one out to someone deserving. I we bet you we have need a, a t-shirt cannon so we can hit the back. Whoa. You're going to say it to Ray Ortega. <laughs> well, you just took out Ray. Hey, Michelle, you want to toss one? I sure do. Michelle actually wants one, but she can't have one. Send it far. Wow, good You catch. could be a Michigan quarterback. You want to throw one? You, you got an arm, Elio? Well, don't lose your mic. Okay. Again, to go to Ray. <laughs> all right, we got two more here. All right. Are you all subscribed to Twim? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey. One more. 
This is going to be random. You can turn around and do it backwards. <laughs> oh, we had a fight almost. All right, folks. So, yeah. For those of us who wanted a T-shirt but didn't get one, where can we get these? This you merch. To, you can go to uh, cafepress.com slash twiv and you can find the t-shirts and, and mugs and everything for all the different podcasts. Cell phone cases. Oh, Show me uh, your case, Vincent. Cell phone, this cell is phone really thing. cool looking. This one is, this is Twib, but you can get these in all the podcasts as well. Show your love for science. Um, I carry a virus with me all the time. Is that URL on the website? It is. It is there. And if it's not, we'll make sure it's there. It's there. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Thanks, everyone.